I think what I will focus on now for this panel is a very basic question of what is essential for the Global South to pursue a sovereign and sustainable path towards development, how should it happen? Um, and in this sense, I think there are multiple issues, um, but a very basic understanding has to be that current government's policy on both bilateral and multilateral level continues to be rooted in a falsification of the structural uh, exploitation of the building south by the global north. And you see this in all these summits, um, which we actually refer to as summits of destruction and you're that. Uh, these are ad hoc group of rich countries uh, not following uh, treaty bound uh, legislation and then deciding the terms of how the financial architecture should move forward. So if you think about the, world, uh, the recent multilateral development bank reforms exemplified by the World Bank's and recent Goldmap, the recent Macron Summit, and the Bridgetown Initiative, which actually started in a very inspiring and uh, hopeful note. <coughs> Unfortunately, all of these uh, proposals are focusing on ways of enhancing lending, enabling further integration of capital markets and developing countries at a time when over 50 countries are in danger of debt distress. So in a nutshell, these are not proposals to alleviate uh, crisis, but further opportunities for escalating uh, volunteer financial lending. In this context, I think there are many issues that we can talk about. We can talk about tax, we can talk about reparations, we can talk about well, a complete transformation, but I will mention two things which I think are really urgent. The first is sovereign debt crisis and the role of private finance, and second is the nature of multilateralism we have today. And I think I'm going to be a little bit provocative. Um, so on sovereign debt, I think I'm not going to quote some figures about uh, you know the numbers, the countries, and I think we all all are very much aware of the cost that a developing countries pay for as far as this uh, debt payments. We can try, we can talk about um, child nutrition, malnutrition figures. We can talk about um, their diversion of resources, which is going to public investment, which are going for debt due payments. Uh, but I do want to talk about a kind of social contract which entrenches indebtedness as a permanent condition for developing countries. Uh, and I was recently on a panel in which a very senior scholar uh, said that, um, uh, it was, was very interesting, what she said is, what is there to guarantee that the debt cancellation will not lead to yet another cycle of indebtedness for the global south? So she was of course referring to the highest uh, indebted poor countries initiative, uh, the situation in the 1980s, uh, those comments referred as the lost decade for Africa. And in a way, this is a very incredulous question because what it is asking is for us to consider uh, the, the reversal or the, sorry, the recurrence of the situation of indebtedness, but something which is prior to debt cancellation. I think all of you would know that right now, debt cancellation is akin to daily bread for a lot of citizens around the world, which means that the food security situation is so uh, alarming that we're talking about famines. And in this situation, to ask about the viability of debt cancellation um, is quite alarming. But, but, but at the same time, this is a very important question because it's asking us to consider the drivers of indebtedness. Why do these countries collectively keep ending these situations over and over again? And I think this has to be the first, one of the first contents of the North-South-North dialogue how to eliminate the drivers of indebtedness so we don't end up in these situations, especially now that we have uh, the role of private creditors, which was not the case in the 1980s. So that's the first point. Um, and the second point is on what kind of multilateralism we're talking about. And of course, here we can talk about um, the governance structure, the federal rules institutions, IMF voting uh, in which uh, Global South countries don't have a, a, a an equal voting right. Um, but at the same time, I think a very interesting question is what kind of model is this multilateralism predicated on? And here we have a very linear vision of uh, capitalist development, which is so promising that if countries would uh, follow a certain path of development, everybody would show on a certain or equal levels of profitability. 
So on the one hand, there is the erasure of, uh, uh, of exploitation of colonialism, but at the same time, there is a promise here that there would be no extraction, there would be no cheap resource extraction, no labor, and you will somehow get to that level. This means that all of us will somehow become East Asian pioneers, right? Because this is the only one thing you have for development. And I think we have to go back and investigate the drivers of that development to then question the East Asian exceptionalism, which actually was a very specific kind of uh, route to development allowed to certain countries uh, in the context of geopolitics, in the context of war, and especially in the context where they were given certain uh, opportunities, but many compromises, uh, which of course we see in their own class based structures. And then we have to ask is this multilateralism and this kind of capitalist development the answers for the new world order? Finally, I think um, all that already mentioned, um, you know, we heard about the South South, uh, the, the need for South South dialect, dialogue to be stronger to the uh, South North dialogue. And it's very important because. In many ways, it's more complex and more fragmented than moving towards the South and North dialogue. I'm from Pakistan, uh, where we don't speak to Bangladesh, we don't speak to India. We culturally, um, frame-wise, uh, economically, we're very isolated. But we do speak to certain powers, and we do follow a certain trade model, model, a certain development model, which then is not to our benefit. And I think here we need to understand what kind of South-South development we can pursue, which then allows us to be a block to then talk about other kind of treatment. And finally, the last one, I think there is a, something to consider is that there is a concerted effort to somehow talk about poverty, poverty in the North as akin to poverty in the South. So a lot of people now consider these as common denominators. And I think this is a very uh, dangerous situation because it's it's trying to harmonize and erase at the same time a colonial history, but also uh, in a way absolve the problem of the monopoly capitalism that we have now, and also go back to this false problem that there could be some form of regulation which could lead us to a situation uh, prior to the design crisis. So with these, I give the panelists the floor to continue this dialogue. Thanks a lot.